thanks for having us uh, here today. I'd like to start by acknowledging in this presentation there's a lot of passion and, and, a, and a wide array of opinions when it comes to fiber to home viability, especially in the U.S. cable industry. And I recognize and truly appreciate all the various points of view around the industry. Since we're short on time, um, I'm asking you to temporarily suspend your personal disbelief, however blasphemous in your world that might be, and assume the following things as fact. Operators will continue a path towards deploying fiber deeper in their networks. Justifying new build, plan extensions, and new market entry remains a challenge for you. Consumer demand for bandwidth will eventually exceed what HFC can deliver via DOCSIS and other compression technologies. Pure IP delivery of content, including video, will eventually be the standard. And the long-term end game for a full fiber to the home um, architecture is in play for most operators. And finally, if cost and ROI were not an issue, we'd all be building fiber to the home networks. So when we're defining rural, if I ask you to visualize rural America in your head for two seconds, what image pops into your head? It's probably something along the lines of this. Right? There's nothing wrong with that. It's probably what 90% of you think of um, and envision. But the reality, rural in the telecom world is really any low density market that is unserved or underserved with regards to true broadband. We can say that's 10 meg or greater for now and competitive video services. So with this image of rural America, we're not talking about cows. We're not talking about barns and cornfields with this map. We're talking about the possibility of outer suburbs, three-acre lots, uh, half-million-dollar homes, vacation homes, and lake homes, etc. The question becomes, how much of this rural or dense, lower-density territory do you border as an operator today? The more important question to ask yourself is whether you can economically reach lower-density areas of your neighboring footprint with fiber to the home. So why am I up here talking about this? I work for Pulse Broadband as SVP of Business Development. Uh, Pulse Broadband advises and partners with um, entities in low density markets to design, build, and manage fiber in the home projects in areas where telcos and cable operators traditionally just haven't been able to pull off an ROI for fiber to the home. We currently are deploying more than $250 million in low density fiber projects throughout the U.S., exclusively using PON architectures, which comes into play for this presentation, obviously. Our latest clients are self-funded using traditional loan structures. We're not talking about grants or uh, stimulus projects anymore at this time since those programs are over. So the average densities of the markets we work with as Pulse Broadband are 7 to 20 homes per mile. Um, so again, suspending your disbelief, we actually are pulling this off in, in densities of that size. So how is this fiscally possible? So, in continuing to define rural, in fairness, no low density market's the same, just like any other operator, whether you're low density or high density. And there are many variables for each organization for determining um, for themselves whether they can achieve a level of risk and live with the, the capital payback models um, for their organization. But the one consistent factor for all of our low density projects, um, what they require is a, for a feasible ROI, is the most cost effective network possible. And again, this is where PONs come into play. Uh, the passive optical network architecture is the number one key driver for making our networks um, work from a cost efficiency perspective. So underneath the pond, we're, Tom's specifically going to talk to split distributed tap options. Um, underneath that layer of architecture, we have clients that do RFOG, GPON, and EPON to fit their individual needs, circumstances, and, and preferences. Um, again, backing up. I think the big takeaway from here is the fact that none of these projects um, would have been economically possible without the use of PON architecture. From a Pulse perspective, we're particularly excited about Comscope's entry into the EPON market um, because it provides our clients that have been interested in IPTV a new opportunity. So we're happy to announce uh, a few weeks ago that we're partnering with uh, Comscope on our first EPON project in Oklahoma. So. The question for this group um, and this audience, what if I'm not serving a rural market, um, but a low density market? So while well, low density is, is most of the network for rural operators, every operator at some point in their footprint has low density areas. So PON architecture is proving itself to be financially viable, under 20 homes per mile. 
in some of our projects, we're talking about five to seven homes per mile. So every single operator can leverage advancements in pond technologies uh, to cost effectively do two things. And this is really the challenge of the presentation to be thinking about. Can you extend the reach of your current plans with new build using fiber to the home? Can you launch new markets with fiber to the home? And can you prepare yourself for inevitable fiber to the home upgrades? So with that, food for thought, I'd like to turn over to Tom Anderson to talk about the specific business benefits. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. So why PON? Uh, PON in and of itself does three really big things for you. It integrates all your services onto a single network infrastructure, whether that's voice, data, or video. It's all carried over the same infrastructure, so you don't have to build separate networks for your RF video and your IP video and your voice over IP network and your, your analog uh, voice network. It all goes over the same network. It reduces the outside plant cost. Obviously, if you have one network, it's a lot cheaper than having two or three. But you also reduce the, the fiber count uh, in that outside plant network as well. Uh, it's a green solution, uh, and that's not just green in an ecological sense, but it's green in a financial sense as well. It means dollars in your pocket that you don't have to spend on network infrastructure. It means dollars in your pocket in additional revenue from new services that you're able to offer to uh, most demanding data customers in, in your footprint. It, give, it does give you the lowest cost per connected subscriber, and that's important to everyone. Just taking a look at op, um, options that you have, uh, again, not to belabor the point around PON, but PON does provide advantages over a simpler network and a uh, much less fiber-intensive network than point-to-point uh, -point fiber. So if you uh, look at the diagrams and looking at the red lines, that's the fiber. Clearly, in a pond architecture, you have less fiber used than you do in point-to-point in -point networks. That makes a difference in the amount of, of uh, power that's used in the network as well. Won't belabor going through every point on the chart because we don't have a lot of time today. But if you look at the outside plant cabinet deployments and what you have to do to, to power in the outside plant with a point-to-point -point active Ethernet architecture uh, in a, a typical 200-home uh, network, uh, you do use about 2,000 uh, watts. In uh, a, a PON network, whether it's EPON, GPON, or RFOG, you're going to use zero. You can't get better than zero in terms of power usage. Even if you consider, well, you know, gee, maybe I don't use all that power in the outside plant, but i got to use it somewhere else. So let, let's look at the end-to-end -end situation as well. Compared to uh, active Ethernet or a point-to-point -point Ethernet system, with um, that system you're going to be using about 7,800 watts in an outside uh, plant deployment uh, for um, those same 200 homes we were talking about earlier. And in a pond network, you'll use uh, about half that, about uh, 3,800 watts. So let's assume that, okay, I've decided I want to use PON kind of architecture instead of a point-to-point -point Ethernet architecture. What are my choices there? Well, there's a centralized split architecture where you go out to a central point with a single fiber, split that 32 or 64 ways uh, to feed all your customers. Uh, you can use a distributed uh, tap or distributed split architecture where you cascade those splits. You go out and do a 1 by 4 split and uh, then go out a bit further and do a 1 by 8 split, those kinds of things. And I, I think the thing that makes rural broadband possible is this third choice, which is distributed tap architecture. So rather than going out and splitting in a single point, providing equal power to uh, all the, the endpoints from that splitter, uh, you go with a distributed tap architecture and you're able to split off the power that you need in the location that you need. That lets you use less fiber to get out to customers and it lets you uh, optimize your power budget a bit better. Just to make that a little more clear, what an optical splitter is and uh, compared to an optical uh, tap uh, is uh, shown in this diagram. In the upper diagram you can see that it uses two feeder fibers to go out to, uh, to splitters. In the, the bottom part of the diagram, you can see that you come out with one fiber 
through an optical splitter, optical coupler, if you will. That goes to the splitter, and then you continue on with that same fiber down the down the fiber route. So instead of using two fibers to get to four customers, you use one fiber to get to four customers. So how does that really look in, in terms of a, a longer network? Uh, in uh, distributed tab versus distributed split architecture, in the top you can see, again, the red line is the fiber. You have a single fiber coming out to a tab, dropping off power. All those uh, customers get uh, the same, uh, uh, same level of optical uh, power. And you're pretty much constant as you go out further and further in the network. In the lower picture, again, the red is the fiber. You can see you use many more fibers to get to those same customers. And you can also see that uh, your uh, optical levels uh, are not, not quite as consistent as they are in the uh, distributed tap architecture. So let's just drive the point home a little bit harder here. So if you go out in a centralized split architecture, again, looking at the red lines, uh, you come out to a splitter and feed drop fiber both ways uh, from that splitter. This is, um, uh, you, you can see that, from, again, from the red lines, you've got lots of drop fiber. With distributed tap architecture, comparing that, this gives you uh, a lot less drop fiber in the, in, the, in the network. So how does it really work with density? Well, this chart uh, is a little bit of an eye chart, hard to see. If you go across the bottom, it goes in, in uh, home dis densities from five up to 500 uh, homes per mile. The vertical axis is the number of feet of uh, fiber to get to 256 homes past. So if you look at the upper curve, kind of the dark purple version, uh, looking at a traditional centralized split architecture, it'll take you somewhere over a million feet of drop fiber to get to those 256 subscribers. Compare that to a two-part architecture at the, bo at the bottom, uh, where you're using uh, somewhere less than uh, 50,000 feet of drop fiber to get to those same customers. So, fiber's cheap, but it's not free. If you can get that dramatic a difference in uh, the amount of drop fiber that you use, it can save you significant dollars as you, you build your network. You also notice that this goes to, to pretty high densities, and distributed tap architectures save you drop fiber uh, all the way out to a, about 500 homes uh, uh, per mile, which is a fairly dense architecture. So it's, this is not just for extremely low density. It can be used all the way up into uh, higher densities as well to save fiber. How much do you save? Uh, there are distributed taps with two ports, four ports, eight ports, uh, and we compare those to uh, uh, what you get with a centralized split architecture. So just to kind of talk you through the, the numbers here, if you look at a density in the middle of the chart and top of 40 homes per mile, uh, compared to a centralized split architecture, uh, a two-port uh, excuse me, a two-port distributed tap architecture will take you 7.7 .7 times less fiber than uh, the two-port tap. You'll use almost twice as much fiber than centralized split, even with a, a four-port tap. So uh, the savings is pretty significant, in, in particularly in low, rural, uh, low-density areas. So how does it translate into cost? Well, with uh, just for, for the cost of materials and realizing that construction costs are all over the place, um, we've, we've looked at not construction costs in this chart, but just material costs. And material cost for uh, centralized split architecture, looking at the uh, left side of the chart, will be a little over $900 per subscriber for centralized split in five home per mile architecture. About a third of that can be spent using a distributed tap architecture. You'll find that those uh, the lines begin to cross out in the uh, well, 100 homes per mile, uh, 200 homes per mile kind of range. So again, uh, distributed tap architecture is not just for extremely low density, but for uh, moderate to uh, the moderately high uh, density areas as well. So just to sum this whole thing up, 
uh, there are really three pond architectures available to you. Centralized split, split distributed splitter, and a tap, uh, distributed tap kind of architecture. Splitter based, based architectures are popular. That's what everybody has. That's what they've been talking about for years. And from the beginning of pond days, uh, everybody had splitters. But we've, we've taken a look from uh, a technology standpoint, from a cost standpoint, added an optical coupler into the splitter kind of architecture, and uh, so that uh, is, is not terribly talked about a lot until you start looking at the numbers and it becomes rather popular. If you look at the economics, splitter architectures uh, can be very cost effective in high densities. And if you already have a fiber infrastructure in place based around uh, a centralized split architecture, we would not ever suggest digging up your fiber and going with your circuit split. However, in greenfield environments, in overbuilt environments where you're having to install fiber, we would strongly consider that you, use, you consider a distributed tap architecture from a, a cost standpoint uh, and a, a service delivery standpoint as well if you're anywhere below 350 homes per mile. With that, uh, we'll wrap it up, ask if there are any questions, and uh, thank you for your, your attendance and your uh, attention today.